Okay. It's just me and Adriana. So welcome to the English edition of um, <laughs> week two. It's learning culture. And so we had uh, a couple of readings. Let me see, let me bring that up. We had one reading which was George Coros's really short post about um, whether we should uh, encourage students to really have an interest in the course that we're teaching them. I just reread that again um, earlier this hour. And then another post, um, which is much longer by Robert Talbert, which is a repost from 2014, if I recall correctly, uh, about um, whether students are capable of learning themselves and how we should harness that. And then the classic, um, I've used this like a hundred times in seminars of the Logan LaPlante hack schooling. So you weren't around on week zero and one. Am I required to submit? So there's no requirements. Um, this is Ken's weirdness of a MOOC where um, I don't mark anything. I don't check anything. The idea behind this MOOC uh, setup is that everyone just jumps in and, and contributes the way they can. Um, so you're feel free to write as many posts as you want or less. Uh, feel free to do it in any order you want. And feel free to go through from the course website. And I'll actually show this because I do this pretty well every week just to give people a view. Let me share the site. So here we are on the site. It looks a little bit different from my view. Actually, let me quickly, if I can figure out where I am. Uh, there I am. I'm going to open this in a no container because then it removes that uh, weird navigation thing that I have because I'm logged into the course. So this is the week two. If you notice, there's a schedule. There's a schedule, unit zero, unit one, unit two. Because this is a completely open MOOC, because um, all MOOCs should be open, but I don't think they all are, this will be here forever. Like the course from 2016 is still visible. Um, and I don't intend on removing anything at any time. But so if you're coming here later and you're watching this video like in December, which I don't know why you'd be watching our video in December about uh, flip classroom, here comes Daniela. Um, you can go ahead and, and go through this content yourself at any pace. And, and that's why I like these kind of open courses. So you can go through and go back to see what we did in unit zero or what we did in unit one or unit two. And soon unit three will be up and then four and five and six. Uh, this is a course built around seven weeks, week zero through week six. And if you look at week two, um, I, I set up a system. Uh, it's a little bit complicated, but I liked having the side-by-side -side English and Spanish for the two languages we're using in this course. Um, there's the intro video for the week, which I record just saying what the instructions are. Basically, I don't say anything that it doesn't say on this text. And then we introduce the topic of the week. The topic of the week is learning culture this week. There's the copy paste of the uh, flip from the fliplearning.org uh, four pillars document. And then I usually throw in some readings and videos that I suggest, but I also encourage that people, um, if they find something they'd rather read or something they'd rather write to contribute to their reflections on the week's topic, that they go and find something else and link that in their blog post. Welcome, Daniela. And then the idea is you, sh you can discuss here. So there's lots of places to discuss and I, and I probably missed a little bit of content on each week. Maybe I'll remember to do it this week. Uh, but in the email I sent to everyone, I recommended you could go to a Facebook post that I created in our Flip Learning Facebook group and comment below there or start another thread. Or you could go onto Twitter and post your idea about this week's topic. Use the open flip hashtag because then it's much more likely that anyone else in this course might see that post if they're following the open flip hashtag and see your post and interact with you about it or feel free to see what someone else has posted and interact with them that way. And then the other way to interact with people in the course is, well, um, I want to read post in Spanish and you could see what these latest five posts are. John's came up, John's came up, Javier, Julio and Elizabeth. Or if you clicked on Entradas Recientes here, it would show you the most recent posts. And if you don't have a picture on your post, you get my dog, Bailey. Um, this one has a picture. And you can go down and, and look for a post that you're interested in. And if you find one, go ahead and click on it. 
and it'll bring you to that author's blog site. So you're seeing their view according to their design and you could read their post. Cool, good use of memes. Oh, this looks like Durley's, definitely. Um, and then go and read through it. And then you could put a comment there and say, hey Durley, I really like what you're saying. Um, have you thought about this? Maybe you, if you have a chance, you can go look at my post and point them to their to your post as well. So this is the kind of interaction I'd like to see in what we call a, a connectivist MOOC. Um, and so it doesn't show all of it on one page. You'll notice, and I, I sometimes have to remember to point this out. If you go to the bottom of the page of all the posts, you have to click on older posts and you'll see ones from page two, which are older posts than the one it's, it shows it in reverse chronological order for these Spanish posts. And if you're interested in only English posts, well then click on recent posts here and you will see the most recent posts that came out in English. Uh, there's one from Montserrat. There's one from Flipped English Intonation. I'm not sure the name on that one. I'd have to look it up in my secret sheet. Eugenia made a post. I believe that's Eugenia from Puebla. Um, and so you can interact that way with the content. So um, the course is different that way, that it's a CMOOC and you're going to get out of it what you want to get out of it. And you're going to put into it what you want to put into it. Ken's not here to judge you. Ken's not here to mark you. To be honest, when there's like a hundred people here, there's just no way I can get around to, uh, to doing it all. Yeah, so that's the interesting thing, June, is I, um, one thing that will happen when the course is over, right now, if you happen to click on somebody's post, it takes you to their post on their website. What I do later when this course is over, and all of my courses, because I use this for my undergraduate classes, there's a little switch I turn. And then when the course is over, it actually keeps you inside my system because I have an archive of all the posts and they're internal. Uh, but it also says, this is a post from Daniela. And then it says the original is located here and it'll leave a link to the original for someone that wants to go look at the original. Um, I usually do this because sometimes uh, people eventually you know, decide to delete their blogs or delete their posts and, and they stay here um, one thing I make it clear to everyone that's participating in a course like this, and it's really important um, for my university students, is I say, you know, if five years later you decide, Ken, I really, I'm embarrassed about that post I made five years ago. Can you please remove it from your website? I'm happy to remove something if, if you've decided later that you don't want it to be there for whatever reason, um, and that's valid as well. But that's the idea behind this kind of setup um, I participated in a course like this many years ago, and I thought it was a really cool idea. And I started copying this idea of syndicated blog posts to use for my students. Um, a lot of work that I do now is more about open education and open practices. Um, it's, it's, I'm not just a flip teacher. Um, I think all of <laughs> us are not just a flip teacher. We, we, we drive our own things. Cool. Yeah, it's just a technique. Yep, it's just another technique. But uh, as 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 Ad, Andrea and, or Adriana knows, um, we get labeled. Like I'm I'm still labeled inside of our institution as oh, it's that flip teacher guy, because <laughs> <laughs> that's how they know you, right? How's it going, Daniela? Good to see you. Okay, I'm with the iPad, so it's more difficult to. Um, yeah, to the touch, controls so. are trickier. <laughs> right, so yeah. No, fine, fine, I'm fine. Right, I'm fine. I haven't been interacting much, really. That's a shame. I haven't had the time to, to do no, so, but I've been reading okay. around. Yeah, and I've been saying different comments and things, right? Sometimes inspiring things that then um, well, um, I wrote about um, in my own post, right? The flipped learning, in, the, the flipped intonation is, is mine. Yep. That's what mm -hmm. I, I right. it but rang a bell, but I wasn't going to, I was mm -hmm. going to embarrass myself by saying right. the wrong yeah. name while I was right. doing yeah. it. Mm -hmm. right. But yeah, so, it just shows the I, I liked, title of the blog. I like the topic for this week. Yeah, I liked it a lot. Yeah. I think, and, and, and you know, that it's something that I experienced, I, I guess I said this in, in another meeting, but that I experienced a lot this year that uh, we had to teach our students to learn <laughs> first and to teach our students to, I mean, to learn in general. Yeah. And so, um, although this idea of the fit classroom was around in my mind for quite a long time right. now, but 
I know, two, three years already. Um, I, and I was planning to implement it. Well, I was um, pushed into implementing it um, quickly, right, without much thought. And, and we all, I realized that the first thing that I needed to do was to teach students how to learn and right. to teach students how to learn with technology because we assumed that, they, right. would, this is excellent. that, that yes. they would know it, that they yep. would manage it, and, and they don't. I think nope. that that's one of the most important things that they are learning this year, to learn how to learn, to learn how to get organized without a teacher being behind. Um, I think that's, uh, and it took a long, long time. Probably, you know, we, we assume that next year uh, in March here in Argentina, we're going to start uh, online as well. I mean, we're, going, we're not going back to, to classrooms next year, uh, at least for the first term that goes from March to June, more or less. Uh, yeah. And so we expect that next year is going to be different because the students that we will have we already have been involved in this kind right. of methodology. So I'll see hopefully if that's any different. Yeah. It's interesting. So are you, are you in session now, Daniela? Yep. Yeah, and when, yeah. did, when did yours start, your session? Uh, in really? March. I started in March. Uh, oh, so the you're lucky near the end of it. March, March okay. to July, and we started directly online. Okay. Um, and then uh, we have the winter holidays in July. And now right. we're in our second term uh, that ends in December okay. uh, before uh, Christmas. And then we start again in March. Because right? so, one thing I did is um, because we were February, mid-February through June, um, our other semester. And then I did summer in July. And I made a conscious decision this semester, we're in week four now, that I spent a lot of time in the first week to really talk about the environment, about mm. what it means to learn online. Um, the fact that um, our institution is really encouraging teachers to be more asynchronous and not mm -hmm. so much just lecture synchronous sessions. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's gonna drive more self um, reliance on, on scheduling and time and planning and mm -hmm. so I, I, I made a conscious effort this semester to really talk about these things. Mm -hmm. And um, in our edu coffee that we just had, uh, there's edu coffee every day at 1 p.m. and 6 p.m. Uh, local time for me in Mexico. Um, Jacob and Gerardo were talking about this, that um, we kind of need to spend the time to tell our students about what it means to do what we're doing right because june doesn't have his camera on and that's fine and he doesn't have his microphone on but he's interacting here in the chat and that's mm -hmm. good too mm -hmm. and, and adriana and myself and daniela uh, we have our cameras on and it makes a difference like um in my first class for all of my sessions this semester i said okay everybody turn off your camera and then mm. I took a screenshot of what it looked like for me as a professor with 20 students, all <laughs> of them with their cameras off. And most of them haven't updated their photo. Like June has a photo. It's, a, it's like a, a Powtoon type of uh, avatar picture. And that's, that's nice too, because it gives me, I, I think about that avatar when I'm thinking of him. And for my mm -hmm. students, the default in our institution is it just has a letter. So it's like, mm -hmm. there's an A and a D you're, and a J. And it's like, this is so nation. horrible and generic. And I showed them and I said, mm -hmm. so at least go and change your profile and give me a picture of you or a picture mm -hmm. of your dog or a Dragon Ball Z character or whatever you want to put. I don't care. But it's, it's so much more personal than just a letter. Yes. And, yes. and this yes. environment we're living in learning, yes. we have to... Um, and, and Model. This back channeling, I mean, if, if you're not saying, yeah. if you're following what you're saying, if, if you're not, if, if you're talking, it happens to me, if you're talking and, and some students are writing, so you stop because you see that they are trying to write something uh -huh. down or copying something. So you have, if you haven't got that, which in, in my case, same thing happened. First, they, they would not turn on the cameras and say, okay, we are, I don't know if you're following, if you're there, if you're not there. Um, I have no idea. So please stop me or say something in the chat or yeah. ask questions or so yeah, then now some of them, not all of them, but some of them um, do turn on their cameras and it's far more interactive. I, I end up interacting with those mainly. Yeah.
but we all yeah, know. that's that's the interesting point to make too. But I I found that because I work in a lot of communities where we'll be like at a virtual conference or an online conference, and and the keynote speaker's mm -hmm. talking, and the text chat is just like a it's zooming by. Everybody's really interacting on the side channel or the back channel, mm -hmm. and you yeah. almost stop paying attention to the to the keynote speaker because you're having such an engaging <laughs> conversation off on the side but then it's okay because you go i can watch the keynote later because it's recorded um and i think some of our students they're so used and this is a flip learning thing too is they're so used to passively just listening to a lecture mm. they're they're not used to you know being active in in the class mm -hmm. and i right. and i think we're you're you're right um Daniel, I think we're going to, it's going to change into the next semesters, and uh, I hope mm -hmm. so. Um, two of my groups are first semester students, so it's, everything's new for them anyway. Because um, mm -hmm. they're switching right. from high school to university. But it'll be, uh, it'll be kind of fun if I get a chance to work with them next semester and see how, <laughs> right. how yeah. they've evolved. Mm -hmm. um, other thoughts you had about, about the readings, the, the George or the Robert or... Um, there was an, another one that I liked that said if we have to force our students to uh, be there all the time, th this is not exactly uh, George it, but yeah. to follow all the activities, everything that, that we need to do, if they are up to standards anyway. Right. So, and I, I agree really, if, just, if a student mm -hmm. is not interested but, but can do what you need them to do by the end of the year, well, it's all right. I mean, yeah. it's okay. That happened this morning for my son, my 12 year old in his class, where mm -hmm. they, they kind of all figured out that, okay, if everyone gets it, everyone gets the objective for today, we shared what we're sharing. It's an, it was an English class, like English language class. And, and we're all good. And it's like, okay, let's just close the session then and, and go mm -hmm. do something else and get ready for your next class. Because there's no point just, well, it says we need to stay here till you know, 8.50, so we're going to stay here till 8.50 because we're complying with the the rules, like George Coro said on his blog post. Why do I have to come? Well, it's the rules. And it's like, there's no, it was just kind of a stupid answer, he said in retrospect, but it's like, well, because that's what we're supposed to do. And um, Again, we, we fall into the same thing we were, we were talking about last time, that was um, rules that are in the institution. I mean, yeah. If you're not given it just a course that, that you yourself organize, you're part of an institution and for instance, in the university yeah. where I work, uh, to, to pass a course you need, uh, that's all cancelled now, but 75% of attendance. Right, we don't do that anymore. Face-to-face -face -face attendance. To, yeah, what was the so number like, in yeah, the, I mean, the tech? It, it, but it is a requirement. Yeah, it was, that, for us it was, uh, it was higher, it was like 88. Um, you mm -hmm. could only have two of two of the 16 weeks you could be absent. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's about 88% attendance. Mm -hmm. And you'd find yeah, students, are, they're running to make it to class and they <laughs> slide into the room and then they're in the back <laughs> of your class studying for chemistry because they need to study for the chemistry quiz. But the only reason they're in your classroom is because they need to be there for the attendance. Mm -hmm. And um, right. we just made the decision yeah. just over a year ago, a year and a half ago <laughs> to switch that we're not doing attendance anymore. Mm -hmm. But it was an adjustment. Some teachers would take it personally. It's like, well, nobody showed up. Well, not nobody. Like, I, I, well, I, never, but that, I don't like to use the word nobody because then they were insulting the five people that are in your classroom. But, but that's another good point for you to think of because if nobody needs to go to your class, it's because it's, you're not giving them anything that they, they, <laughs> they cannot do if it's, it's possible. not. I mean, that, that they can do whatever you, you're mm -hmm. there for, they can do on their own. So right. we all think yeah. about how that you, they might need you. Right. Um, so or they just might need you at a different time. And that's where mm -hmm. my concept of synchronous on demand, especially mm -hmm. now with Zoom, mm -hmm. I really like it. And my students like it that, okay, well, you know, if you need me later in the day, make an appointment and I've got my appointment system and they make a 15 minute mm -hmm. appointment for a one-on-one -on -one session or a small group session because they needed me at 6 p.m not at mm -hmm. 9 a.m. when they were all stressed out about their exam in the other course that was at 10.30 or whatever. Um, yeah. We're not the center of their attention. <laughs> totally not. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 yeah, sorry, Adriana, go on. Go ahead, Adriana. Uh, yeah, and attendance shouldn't be, I 
I love, I didn't, you didn't I quit live in that. The, you were there before we I, stopped the attendance. Yeah, I quit the institution before they stopped taking attendance, but, but they, students must find other motivations other than the attendance mm -hmm. to be in your class. Mm -hmm. the, and, and the consequences of not attending, I think it's more productive to... Yeah. It's to, still my, to, it's my Twitter background, still the conversation with Salvador Alba when he came and visited my class, the, the lead top guy of our institution, was talking with those students that day about attendance because they all said, well, Ken doesn't make us have attendance. <laughs> so that was when I was being a rebel and we were still doing attendance and, and he had a long conversation with them about it and he, and he said what you were saying Danielle if you know if if the students don't need to be here then why should they have to be here um, and they had a really cool conversation it was really nice um, it reminds me when I see that that picture on my Twitter feed um, mm -hmm. that it, it was such a hard thing to change culturally right because some of my colleagues would say they're not old enough and i said well how old do they need to be that we're going to remove the they're attendance not, like 23 25 not, 50 they're I don't not know. children like, no mm -hmm. so it was interesting mm -hmm. how some people have this cultural idea that you have to take attendance or the students aren't going to mm -hmm. comply it, mm -hmm. it, it also it makes me so mad when when they ask us to treat university students as children they're not children they know what they're doing mm -hmm. and and if you treat them like children they expect to be treated like children and they act like children and and they follow a compliance system as opposed yes. to i'm going to learn because i want to learn about it but it is hard i mean my, my system's radical that i say here's the topics i want you all to go and find information to learn about the topics we'll discuss them as a group I will point you to things if you can't find them, but I want you to go out and find the material to learn about these six key core topics in my course that I'm teaching this semester. Mm -hmm. And it's hard well, for them. don't, it, not used to that's very That's very hard, Ken. That's very yeah. hard because, uh, because students are going to be, I mean, if you told me that um, on any subject and then you go to, I know, um, to the internet, probably. Yep. Uh, but even if, if you decide to go to a library, uh, there, there's so much information yeah, that you need to, to make it manageable. Wow, that's, I think that, that that's truly something that, that we teach us. I mean, it's, it's one of our biggest jobs to yep. make uh, to information, let's say, manageable. Like, yep. Okay, we'll start with these, continue with these, continue with the other yeah. part. Mm -hmm. And I can't do that with first years so much, but this is a group that's almost graduating. So this mm -hmm. is this is the goal is I want them to be able to continue learning when they graduate mm -hmm. and they need to be able to do these skills of finding good content for themselves mm -hmm. and knowing that it's good content and what's not good content and what's false news mm -hmm. and what's good yes. news. But it's still it's different for them. And I've had this with teachers in this type of course where I'll say, here's eight readings. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh my God, Ken, that's way too much readings. And I said, no, but if you read the instructions, it says just choose two of them. But they, mm -hmm. many people are not used to choice. Mm -hmm. Right. In an environment like, like this. How do I choose? If I choose wrongly, I mean, if I, <laughs> if I choose to read the one that is not worth reading, um, I mean, it takes a lot of time. It's really time consuming for the students as well. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I see yeah. that modeled here as well. I, I, I recommend that you can find something else, but it's interesting how most people mm -hmm. just go with what's been assigned and they don't go <laughs> dig deeper. But we're so Basically. conditioned. Well, we're so conditioned to do it that way. Or, or you're deferring. You're saying, well, you're the expert, so I'm going to read what you suggested to read. And mm -hmm. that's, um, that's led me to this radical idea or extreme idea of, I don't suggest anything to my students on mm -hmm. the topics because if I do, they're only going to go with the one I suggest because I'm mm -hmm. the authority figure. Mm -hmm. And so to get them to go out and find their own stuff, I have to kind of force the issue. Um, but yeah, I get a lot about it. I, I get some pushback from some students that aren't used to this. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, no, it's interesting. Interesting. Very no. interesting. And what is no it? What is it that you teach? It's, it's a software, um, software, um, quality and testing course. So it's a it's an advanced mm -hmm. software engineering course for students near the end of their degree program. 
Um, I can do it a little bit more like this for this group of students because the majority of them have been in two or three classes with me before. So they mm -hmm. know like Ken's weird style of teaching and, and they're blogging mm -hmm. like this course is mm -hmm. and they're all used to it. I think I only have two students in this group that have never taken a class with me. Um, but like any university system, I mean, we all have our reputations, you know, Adriana mm -hmm. talked about my <laughs> reputation in another week. Um, <laughs> But they're used to it and they've heard about it and they're like, oh, you got to you got to read stuff and then you got to write about what you think about the stuff you read and not just repeat what it says in the book. Because um, mm -hmm. that's my that's my challenge with them when they're doing this kind of reflective process and reading is that they'll sometimes just, you know, write the classic book report where they're telling me what it says. And I'm like, I, I don't care what it says. I can read it myself. I want, I want your opinion. I want your thoughts. I want your disagreement. I want you linking it to something else or a different experience. And that's hard. Um, yeah, of course. I don't think it's yeah. easy to model. Mm -hmm. And that's what, I want. that's what I want out of this. That's what I want teachers mm -hmm. to do with this. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. hopefully we achieve some of that with this, with this type of course. Mm -hmm. I, I go again on the same idea. How do you do, with it, how do, you do this within the, the institution where you work? Because again, if I, 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 have, I have to follow a syllabus that I have to write right. and I have to include the bibliography that I'm going to use, the bibliography I'm going to give the students, subject yeah. or so, I mean, topic for topic in units. So do you do that and then you do in other things? And then just break all the rules? How do you combine those things? So over the years, um, so we have a defined syllabus. Um, and so actually, if I look at the list of topics on my course, it's, it's visible in the web it's those same list of topics and, and mm -hmm. they need to write about each one of those topics. So my defense at the end of the course is each student has shown mastery to a certain percentage level in each one of those topics. I mean, mm -hmm. even if you have a list, you're never going to say, well, we covered a hundred percent because we never cover a hundred percent because some mm -hmm. student might have 72% in the course. So it, mm -hmm. And we might've dropped some, we've, we've, we've emphasized one more than the other. Um, but the shorter answer to you, Danielle, is I have privilege, and, and I've talked about this before, that <laughs> I've been around for 25 years, um, I've got a full-time professor job, I'm not scared of being fired, so I, I have <laughs> more, and I've said this to my bosses, I'm not scared of being fired, so I'm, I'm more likely to take risks, and for a lot of teachers, and this is related to FLIP, and all the talks I've given about FLIP learning is, teachers are like, I can't do that, because that doesn't fit the rules, and, and I can't take those risks. And I'm like, well, each one of us can adapt our courses a little bit or more, mm -hmm. depending mm -hmm. on our own circumstances. You can't all teach like Daniela or teach like Adriana mm -hmm. or teach like June or teach like mm -hmm. Ken. You have to find what works best in your context for your classroom mm -hmm. and your students. Mm -hmm. um, I've just had more leeway. And it's part of actually being a foreigner in Mexico is I can get away with a lot of stuff because I'm a comedian. <laughs> And it's true. It's true. A lot of yeah. my Mexican colleagues can't really, or they don't think they can get away with things that I get away with. Just, <laughs> oh, it's the crazy Canadian, right? Um, so that's the yeah. shorter answer. No, and it is true. It's, I have privilege. And I have to recognize It's true. That. It's true because I worked in the language department in a different campus. And, and we had French people, uh, yeah. Japanese people. It's the language department, French people, other Canadians, and yeah, they get away with it. <laughs> yep. mm, I mean, and it's, and it's part of why that. they invite us too. They, they invite us to go to these institutions as foreign teachers because they want the students exposed to different ideas and different cultures. And so, well, I'm giving you something different, a different way of learning. <laughs> um, and right. and it, so I can, I definitely, I, I have to, I always have to admit to a lot of teachers when I give these talks that I get away with stuff because I'm foreign and it's true. Right. Yeah. yeah, but but at the same time, you open the way to other teachers to do the same because they can't say right. anything to you. It's like, oh, I'm doing what, what Ken's doing and, and, they, and they can't complain about it because... I mean, it's not flip learning, but one, one thing I've said in a lot of faculty that have a position of privilege at their university say it's it's our responsibility to say things that our colleagues that are more shy can't say 
we we have to kind of push back against the norms or or things like attendance or things like you know thou must follow the syllabus or thou must you know start at exactly 10 minutes after the hour and you're not allowed to finish early for any reason and pushing <laughs> back on that um because why why sit here in the session until the exact minute if the students could go and you know go eat lunch before their next class or, or whatever the situation is. And I'm okay with doing that. Um, I never, I never leave the room early. Um, right now with online teaching, I sometimes like finish the formal part of the class and I finish the recording 20 minutes before the official time, you know, like a two hour session. And I say, okay, we're not recording. And then I will be here. I will be the last person to leave the virtual room. And are there any other questions? And sometimes it, goes into like office hour type environment with a few students. And sometimes we've gone like 20 minutes past when we're supposed to be finishing because I I've got the freedom and that's okay yeah. too. So sometimes I go long, sometimes I go short, but I, I think it really depends on what the students attitudes are. And it's obvious the ones that are like, I got to go because I got to finish studying for my chemistry exam. And the other one's like, Oh, I don't have a class. It's fine. I just want to hang out and talk about random stuff. And that's okay too. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, the one that stayed longer, it's, it's this learning culture thing too, is um, he's not studying a computer degree, but he has a deep desire to learn more and more about computing what I teach. Mm -hmm. And so he keeps pushing me for more and more information. And it's almost <laughs> like that kind of nerdy guy who is like, yeah, you're, I'm, I'm, I don't have time for this all day. But, but it's like they're starving for more information and, and they're stuck in their house and, and he wants to learn more. So he pokes me on Twitter as a DM and says, hey, can you, can you recommend me a book for this topic or this topic? And so I, I think we see a lot of these students that kind of like Adriana says, where we shouldn't just think that they're all here to game the system and, and comply. Mm -hmm. um, they're here to learn, most of them. I mean, it's the rare student who just shows up at university because I don't know what else to do. I just go to university because I finished high school, which is kind of what I did. Um, and that's why I dropped out after the first year. Um, but most students are really have a desire to learn. I, 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 I found that with all of my groups when I give them the space to learn, that they're much more receptive to it. I'm trying to watch the chats to see if June's <laughs> jumping in with some more conversations he's in the future so <laughs> what's it like what's it like on thursday um i'm used to talking to my friends in australia and we always have that joke have you <laughs> so where are you where are you from originally daniela from where you La are Lata, now? buenos aires right. from buenos aires mm -hmm. okay right mm -hmm. so have right. you have you been to another country teaching have you traveled around? Not teaching, no, not teaching. As a student, you've, I've been in England um, mm -hmm. twice, three times, yeah, but um, but not teaching, no, not teaching. Okay, mm -hmm. it's pretty, it's pretty so, common. Yeah, yeah I, I could say that, as you were saying, most students are at university learn. Hmm, in my context, you know, university <laughs> is completely free. Yeah. In one of the only places around the world where you can go, um, you can do all your studies, I mean, from kindergarten to becoming a doctor, completely yeah. for free. So, and luckily, um, we've got lots of students who are there because they haven't got anything to do, right. or because they think that it's the logical thing to do, even when they are not really interested. And so we might have students that remain at university for 12 years. Um, mm -hmm going around and around and around <laughs> yeah because they they don't know what to do they they don't want to work or if, in the city where i live which is called la plata which is a university city mm -hmm. and um mm -hmm. within the province of buenos aires the capital city of yep. the province and so a lot of students come from all around the country um and so they find uh, life in kind of the city uh, fun and well, the city is very lively with all the students, right. but we are then it's kind of as I was saying if, if, if you had to pay for it probably you would think about it. I mean if, if um, entrance, I mean the, the access to university were restricted that would have been another thing, but no, we have no restrictive access so anybody can study anything and you and they cannot test you and say no, you're not up to standard. Interesting. So 
Imagine. Interesting. Imagine. I remember having this conversation with someone from the public university here in Guadalajara. And, mm -hmm. and we're talking about, you know, your students versus your students, because um, I'm at a private institution there at a public. And the, mm -hmm. and, and the public teacher is kind of saying, well, it must be so much nicer with students that are in private university because they're so motivated to get all of their money's worth because they're spending money to, to study. No, and I'm like, they're well, not but, spending but, it. But wait a minute, you've got students that are maybe from a lower level of the socioeconomic spectrum and they're really motivated to get advanced based on their studies to like get ahead in life. And so there's this different polar opposite views. And we come to the conclusion now, students are students are students. It, it, in both contexts, <laughs> they're pretty much the same. Right. Okay. We are so baby. Right. Yeah. I. So the thing is that. But we do have a public system approach. where they have to they have to get entrance, and it's not as open as it is there for sure. They need to no. pass the exams, mm -hmm. and they need to pass a, mm -hmm. a minimum level. To, and even there's there's filters because there's a minimum there's a maximum number of people they enter into each program each year. Um, mm -hmm. So that it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a competition to get in. So that's a, that's a right. environment too. For sure. Well, it used to be like this in here, about up to about five, five years ago, kind of. Yeah. But there was a, a lot of complaints uh, saying that it was discriminatory, right. that uh, blah, 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 things. So in the end, um, it's a mess because uh, there, there were a lot of teachers that had to be hired because right. we had um, freshers, for instance, I know, 1,000 freshers in courses of studies that used to have 100. And so we had right. no teachers, no rooms, no, 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 space. no buildings uh, for so many students. And for instance, in the course that I teach, that is for translating and teaching English as a second language or well, yeah. translating uh, or interpreting, uh, then um, what happened uh, was that a lot of students who don't know English in Rome all the time, right. So they, they, yeah. they can't speak English. So they expect uh, to, to have with English lessons. They say, right. well, no, I mean, it's like going and trying to be you know, a math teacher, but you can't add two plus two. I mean, it's impossible. Right. How come you thought about being a translator if you can't speak English? But the time what worked. came to your mind? <laughs> the yeah. schedule worked but and my, my girlfriend or boyfriend's taking the class, so I registered on my friends. Yeah. It's interesting because so it could happen so now you, you no longer have those restrictions now with online. It's like you could have 500 people in your classroom because it's not a physical space anymore. And I wonder how much we're going to see that now. And, and imagine that how, how much we have to check, I mean, homework that we have to check uh, with uh, homework that are done by people who, who can't right. write a complete sentence. Right. It's impossible. That's of true. course, uh, eventually they, they drop out of university. But there is a lot of work uh, kind of for noisy. nothing. It's kind of noisy mm. work for, for, for the future. That's interesting. Mm. No, we don't, we don't have that issue. Definitely not. We have much more <laughs> gated setups. I, I know a colleague of mine in, in the University of Victoria, um, he was teaching a course, and it was an education course. They invited us to be involved in it in a Twitter chat. Um, but he was, co he was commenting that it was, it was really interesting that semester or term because they had a lot of students that were just taking it as an elective, an education elective, but they were engineering students or business students. Or, and they had this really mm -hmm. weird mix of students in this education course, because a lot of them weren't going to be educators, but they were taking it as an option for accrediting mm -hmm. their degree program. Mm -hmm. And it made it kind of mm -hmm. tricky, the conversation. Because <laughs> you don't have like, the same core um, background. Mm. Interesting. Mm. I was one of those mm. students because I took an education course for some random reason um, when I was in university. I don't even know why I did. It just sounded interesting and, and then I became an educator <laughs> later, funny enough. Mm. And what, what, Adriana, what do you teach? Uh, Spanish. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. Mm -hmm. Spanish. I teach. Well, in Mexico, I taught uh, redacción. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Writing. Right? Writing, yeah. Mm -hmm. And what are you um, teaching June in the chat? If you're still there listening, what classes are you teaching? I've uh, been teaching mathematics. Which, which yeah. levels or which, which type of math? Um, 
college and even high school. Okay. Good. Yeah. Good. So are you are you thinking about how to apply flip to that those groups now? Yeah, because it is a trend here in the Philippines and I mm -hmm. want to learn more from experts. That's why I have been I've been interested uh, I've been so interested to join in this uh, meeting because I know there are a lot more I can learn from you. I think yeah, I, I, I always push that we can learn a lot from each other. Um, but it's always interesting this concept of expert. I mean, I remember when I first went to flip learning conferences and I yeah. I was I was kind of over over um, kind of in awe of, of all these other people making the presentations at the conference and, <laughs> and intimidated and and I ran a session and only three people showed up. I felt kind of like nobody's here to see my session. Yeah. I have, but, I have that kind of feeling too. <laughs> but you why. switch from being the learner to the to the expert really quickly, and and I think one thing that's important for these courses or these groups where we're t where we're talking to each other, June, is your colleagues. Like you mentioned, your colleagues in the in the chat, you'll be like that person teaching your colleagues. Uh, um, this happened to all of us, definitely. That's how I got this reputation of the flip guy at my university system because. I started looking at this and then I went to a conference and then all of a sudden I was traveling around to our different campuses and talking about flip learning. So yeah, you, you'll be the expert tomorrow. There's <laughs> a big weight on your shoulders. Yeah. For, sure. for, the past, for the past few months, I've been seeking for a free um, meeting just like this here in the Philippines setting, but uh -huh. I, didn't, I, need, I didn't find anyone and that's why I switched to switch to don't to join this Good. meeting because I know this is an opportunity for me. And mm -hmm. yeah. And I want this to, to be uh, applied here because I know um Philippines is really behind from what is happening around the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it could be. One thing I notice, um, and and this will be for you, is kind of the challenge. I remember when I was taking a course with John Bergman, who's one of the kind of key people in in flip learning, and he kind of he challenged all of us in that room to say, you know, you're here at this workshop, but when you go back to your institution, you're the one who's going to be the leader. You're the one who's going to make the things happen because mm -hmm. um, just like we're here now. There's like a hundred people who said they were interested in the English version of this course, but only a few people show up for the sessions. It could be time. I mean, you're in, you're in the Philippines. The time zones are crazy different or someone's in Germany, but, um, or they're working. Um, but there's people that are very active and visible and there's people that are more used to following it. And it doesn't mean they're learning less, um, but if you are an active person, you can definitely take that energy and and you will become kind of the star in your environment and people will follow you and and, and look wow. up to you. It, it'll happen. I mean, John Bergman told me, you should be like one of the people in flip learning in Mexico. And I was like, at my university? And he's like, no, in all of Mexico. And I'm like, no, that's impossible. But like, you I are I, I, a kid. I can't do but, Well, yeah, but there's no way I thought about that six years ago, whatever it is, when John told me this at a, at a session at our, he came to our university and gave a workshop and I was like, wow. Um, and, but it's true, it's, it's not hard um, to be active. And, and then I got invited to talk to people in Korea and I travel to Korea and I travel to, to Australia. And it's not because I'm famous and write a book, it's just because I'm kind of loud and I write my blog posts on the internet and I organize things like this. And then people see it and there's, there's people doing way, way, way more important and better stuff than I am in flip learning. I, I point to Robert Talbert. He's, he's excellent. I mean, he's the authority on this in higher education. Um, and he goes around the world and talks as well, but each one of us can be our local experts, definitely at least. And, and I think it's, it's important for us to do that. And it gets back to the conversation we had with Daniela that, um, some of us have privilege some of us are it's easier for us to speak out and i think those of us that can should 
and help the others that don't feel that they can be vocal and speak out and, and ask for change in education. I think that's really, really mm -hmm. important. For me, it is. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that, I like this. Um, for me, the learning culture is probably the most obvious pillar. It's just like, well, we should all be learning. Um, for me, the hard one was the next one. The intentional content for me was the hard pillar to get my head around when I first thought about flip learning. But I think each of us have a different view. Yeah, but, but learning culture, I mean, to, I, I see learning culture, maybe I'm wrong, but I see learning culture as teaching students to how to learn mm -hmm. uh, together mm -hmm. with the content that you teach. Mm -hmm. And and that there, there is a lot more out there. I mean, that's the way I saw it in my own context. Okay? I have to use this bibliography, but I tell you that there is a lot more than you can find. Oh, yeah. Even that contradicts what I'm telling you. Yeah. And but we are, so far we have to limit it to this, but know that there is a lot more and that you can learn, that you can continue. But um, but to to empower, let's say, uh, students to to understand that it's up to them, because that's the other thing that students tend to do. They blame the system, the teachers, the environment, mm -hmm. the possibilities. Yeah. I mean. They blame it. They they are never to blame mm -hmm. for what mm -hmm. they know and what they don't know. Right. So I always tell them when they they reach. I I I, I work in first year and second year, mm -hmm. and in many cases um, I receive students in first year say, "Well, but I I never had I know English lessons in this way." Okay. Yeah. What did you do for to learn English in any right. case? I mean, nowadays you've got so many things to do. I mean, right. what did you do? I mean, you didn't have a teacher there who taught you this thing. Yeah. Is, is that your teacher's mistake? Mm -hmm. So are you going to tell the teacher, no, in fourth year university, no one told me about that? Yeah. But if you know that that's what you need, you should be able to get, go and get it. Sure. And, and I think not, that, that that's students, an important it's, part. It's a human thing. Even faculty mm -hmm. say the same thing. They're like, well, I don't know how to use Excel. They haven't given me a course on how to use Excel yet. Well, you can just look on YouTube. You can, you can do it yourself, really. It's not a hard. Mm -hmm. You can learn to play guitar or you can learn to mm -hmm. play a video game by watching other people play mm -hmm. video games. Like, they, we're, learning's natural. My 12-year-old my son has no class that teaches him how to play Fortnite, but he's figured it out pretty well by watching other people on YouTube videos how to play Fortnite, right? So we can learn. It's natural. It's just right, but they don't the tool take as a system is that it's about mm -hmm. compliance. So it's mm -hmm. not natural to learn school stuff by yourself, but we're used to learning everything else by ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's so why, I, where I say I think it's natural, but it's not natural because we're used to living in this set of rules of school. Even if you think of the structure of school, I mean, school, university, whatever level it is, if I picture my classroom, I still have uh, a lot of students sitting in rows of with me at the front and the, and the, the, front. And the whiteboard behind. Yes. The only difference in my case is that because I'm involved with the pronunciation and stuff, I've got a lot of computers Walk and headphones. Yeah. <laughs> That's the only difference. So yeah. the organization of the room tells you that they are there to listen to what I have to say. <laughs> and there's the classic, um, I, I should share this, there's the flipping physics video where John uh, Thomas Palmer, he, he talks about the difference between a traditional classroom and a flip classroom. I'll send the link out probably this week. But um, he points out that when he's showing the video of his typical flip classroom, it's like you have to have an arrow there showing where the teacher is in the room because the teacher isn't standing at the front of the room. The teacher's like in mixed with students. And if a high school principal came in, she'd be saying, Where's the teacher? The teacher's not in, in her regular space at the front of the room. Yeah, this this room is a mess. Yes, what it's is noisy it and doing? active and, I, and that's the way I the got, classroom should be. I got one of those yep. when I was t still teaching prepa. Mm -hmm. I, I got a, a, an attention call because my room was a mess and I was so <laughs> offended. I was so... Uh, what... Why didn't you come in and ask what I was doing? Why I I I, I it still makes me mad because because uh, the the principal of the of the high school just showed 
his head over the little window <laughs> on the <laughs> in the door and and then decided that my room was a mess and oh, I'm so mad. Right, because students are accustomed to, uh, and students and institutions in general, to the thing that, okay, we have to be here, sitting, listening to you, you're going to open yeah. our, our heads and you're going to put things into it and as it's long as we can vomit that, yeah. right, as long as you can then vomit that literally and, and uh, we, are that, we are going to pass the course, that's yeah. it. <laughs> so. Yeah. It's, I think that this Peter is very important. Oh, it's, it's, very it's, it's important. critical. It, it, yeah, my, my point is it's kind of obvious, but not obvious. Because, I mean, learning no. is normal. We're, this is, I mean, no. babies, babies learn, but within the context of an educational system, we're not mm -hmm. used to. And that's where, where, where my definition of flip is much more not about flipping the videos or flipping homework or flipping. It's flipping who's responsible for the learning. And for me, that's mm -hmm. that's the essential part for me of flipping is who is in charge of driving the learning. Um, mm -hmm. And it's led to conflicts because students get mad because I'm not teaching them. I'm like, well, exactly. I got no, that. No, it's not my job to teach I got that you. exact phrase. I got a phrase a couple of uh -huh. weeks ago saying, but we, we haven't had lessons, they said. Yeah. How well, come? I mean, what they expect. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, they equal lessons to the synchronous moment in which I speak and they write, um, and that's it. I mean, so it's amazing. Yeah. That was so I think it's a related. very important piece. Oh, if you get a chance and you're watching our videos on YouTube about OpenFlip, give us a thumbs up because actually I got a thumbs down on one and a comment, and and it was obvious that the person didn't actually watch the information. They just oh, <laughs> flip learning's horrible. And it's like the typical reaction of uh, it's automated learning and robot learning, and there's the teacher doesn't do anything. And it's like, <laughs> did you actually that's great. The, did you actually watch the video? That's just your interpretation based on a small amount of information you have. But it is it is a common uh, interpretation theme. If, mm -hmm. if the teacher's not mm -hmm. teaching, we just learn by ourselves, mm -hmm. and, and that's mm -hmm. not what it's about. It's it's our job is to guide them and help them. And each student's different. And it's a lot more work, I think, um, mm -hmm. to do uh, differentiated learning. And that's what this, this unit of learning culture is about, is creating a differentiated learning for our students. And if we are completely in control, it's impossible to do differentiated learning because we're just lecturing. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's what students expect in any case. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> they, yeah. they want everything the same for everybody and that everybody has to say exactly the same at the same time. Equity and versus yeah, equality. That, that's what they expect too. So it's very difficult, mm -hmm. right? It's very difficult to go against the institution, go against students' uh, thoughts. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, in, in the, that's why I tell you that for me, I think that this year is key this year. I mean, students are learning yeah. to learn. Um, we hope whatever so. it is. Yeah, because they have been forced. By, I, by the pandemia. And, and I hope that we learn a lot as educators, because I think a lot of educators wanted to do things differently, but it was so easy to keep doing things the same every year. But we, we've been forced to do things differently because mm -hmm. of the way we're teaching now. And I hope mm -hmm. that'll create a lot of good thoughts about how we change our practice when we go back inside the classroom, mm -hmm. when, whenever that happens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of happy here. Pablo's yeah. letting me in back channel. Mm -hmm. here. Said I didn't send him the link. So that's about all we got time for. Did you did you want to add something in again, June? I think you got your microphone open. No, I was just I was just listening to the conversation and I was really amazed with, with the with the convo, both of you, because I was I only thought that it 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 happens only here, but it also happens with you. Oh, it, it happens everywhere. Um, it's funny. People, people say this only happens in Mexico or students are always procrastinating because they're Mexican. I'm like, nah. And I don't even like <laughs> the word student there. Humans procrastinate and in every country and every culture. So um, I think often we think it's different where we are. Um, and in many ways, it's the same. I think there's some differences the way our students um, work together and 
cultural different contexts. They're they're more deferring to authority in different cultures versus others. And but I think in all of our cultures, students are very much used to this passive learning yes. style. Mm-hmm. It's because what's we've been doing since the industrial revolution. So um, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm glad you can make it. And uh, for those of you that are watching, it's, it's, it's interesting how the Spanish and the English group is so different. The English group is like this smaller group. Um, and I like that, <laughs> but the Spanish thing is kind of a, it's, it's like a zoo. There's 46 people connected in the Zoom session. So it's, it's a complete different, uh, different kind of setup. So I'm looking forward to how tomorrow goes with a big group of people that show up for the Spanish session. And then like Adriana said today, they're, they're engaged. Um, people are thinking about it. People are posting, and and that makes me excited because my job is just to kind of give people a space to think about these things. Uh, it, just like in my classroom, it's not my job to teach you, um, mm-hmm. <laughs> and I kind of refuse to do it. But uh, I'm happy to share what my thoughts are and my experiences, as well as Adriana, who's got a lot of experience, and Daniela, and yourself as well, June. So thanks everyone for coming. I will wrap up the session for today. Oops, where's my stop recording button?